Okay, welcome everybody to this evening's session at Aston University. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all with us. We've got over 90 people in the room now from all over the world. So fantastic to see so many students, staff and alumni here to join us. Um, we are recording tonight's session, so you will be able to watch back again later. And I'm not going to spend too much time introducing. I'm going to let John introduce himself. But it is an absolute privilege to have John with us here tonight, shortly before the launch of his book. John's been a friend of Aston for a very long time, studying with us as well. So he will share all of that with us as we go. So it's a pleasure to have you with us, John. And I will hand over to you. Thank you, Amy and all the team for setting up tonight and all the preparation that you've put in. Good evening everyone and welcome. Uh, fantastic just sharing with you now in the chat room. We've got people from literally all over the world. Um, China, Nigeria, Jamaica, Massachusetts, Washington. Uh, it's well and truly a global village I think tonight for Aston University and Aston Business School and uh, really exciting to, uh, to engage you. I'm here in uh, little old Birmingham uh, about sort of seven from campus so um, I'm, I'm a local lad here in Birmingham but but great to have the global perspective for this evening. I'm very excited about engaging you for the next hour and a half. Uh, I'm conscious that some of you may have had a day already of Zoom and Teams and virtual working um, so I'm grateful that uh, you've committed the time and as I say I'm really excited about working with you and the two reasons I'm excited really today. Um, first reason is as Amy says I'm a um, a graduate of Aston. Um, Aston is my alma mater, as, as they say in Latin, my nourishing mother. I did my MBA at Aston Business School 1987 to 1991 and between 2012 and 2018 uh, I did my DBA and the work that I'm going to show you with this evening, uh, a lot of that work and research is from my DBA studies at Aston. So it's a great um, experience for me to come back and, and do this session after all uh, that work at Aston and uh, the alma mater is, is the nourishing mother and uh, I hope that I can be a nourishing mother to you all for the next uh, hour and a half as we uh, as we share this evening. The second reason I'm excited about this session tonight is that is the title really Nine Habits for the New World of Work and you know isn't it exciting and I know it's a difficult time for a lot of people I know that we're in the middle of a global pandemic but I don't want to apologize for being excited about the possibility that we might be at a point of inventing a new world of work. I do think that we've got a once in a decade opportunity as business leaders uh, and thinkers to vision a new world of work. And, and as somebody who enjoys thinking, who enjoys studying, um, then the possibility of envisioning that new world of work, I think is, is extremely exciting and I hope that you this evening um, can, can feel some of that excitement. Uh, I mean I've had some great teachers um, at Aston over the years. I can remember Dr. Raul Espejo from my MBA who inspired me on systems thinking, uh, Professor Nick Lee uh, from my DBA who inspired me around research methods and these, um, these teachers um, they opened my eyes to new things um, and, and when my eyes were open to new things uh, it, it gave me that excitement, but also it gave me that hope, you know, that hope that, that there's new possibilities out there. And uh, tonight, as I say, I, I want to open your eyes. That's my objective really is, is to open your eyes at the end of this session that maybe you might have seen things from a different perspective. But also I want emotionally to give you that feeling of excitement and that, that feeling of hope, because I think hope is something that we all maybe need a little bit of an injection of right now. So that's where we're heading and we're going to get to that destination really by way of three sprints. An hour and a half webinar sounds like a long time to me at the end of a day, at the end of a working day. So I want to break it down really into three sprints. I want to do three 20 minute bursts of content and then I want to open it up to you uh, to ask questions. And I know that a lot of you have already been in that chat room. Please um, populate the chat room with questions as I share what I'm sharing. Amy will be looking at that chat room and when we pause after the sprint um, Amy will will uh, pull out some questions and then we'll have five or ten minutes of, of just talking through your questions because that's how I'm going to feel your connection tonight. You're not sat in front of me in a lecture theatre 
So somehow we need to bridge that gap, don't we? We need to make that connection. So please use the chat room so that I can feel your presence and really sort of hone some of this content to what you're thinking about and the questions that you have. So there's gonna be three sprints, three 20 minute sprints. Sprint one is um, seeing with new eyes. So I want to start the session today by talking about paradigms and perspectives and inviting you to think that maybe this new world of work might need us to see with new eyes. Sprint two uh, is about leading with new habits. And the new habits, that sprint is gonna be the theory of these new habits. So the research that I did at Aston Business School as part of my DBA generated a model called the nine habits of trust. And so that model is a tool that can help everyone, but leaders in particular, navigate through this new world of work because it allows us to get intentional about building trust and trust is the one thing that changes everything so if we can get a roadmap for trust then if we can get that concept clear in our minds then it gives us the theory of leading with new habits so that's sprint two sprint three is the practical application of those new habits so in the final sprint today, I want to get very practical with you. I want to get down to some tips and tricks around how you can use these new habits right now, today, in whatever role you do, whatever relationships you are uh, responsible for. I would just want to give you some um, some tips that have come up, come up from working with leaders over the last three months in this pandemic, all of whom are struggling to adapt to this new world of work. And through listening to those leaders uh, and working with this model, I've got some sort of uh, nuggets that I can share with you about what's working for them and hopefully that will uh, give you some ideas about what might work for you. So we're going to go from the big picture, 30,000 foot perspective of paradigms and then we're going to bring it down to specific tangible practical actions. So I hope that's a, an inviting sort of menu for you evening and um, with that I'm going to start with the the first sprint, seeing with new eyes. So hopefully you can see on your screen a beautiful picture. This is uh, an image that for me is my favorite image from the lockdown period. This is a photograph taken from the village of Pathankot in Northern India. And in that village on a morning in April, the villagers woke up, saw something they hadn't seen for 30 years. 200 kilometers away from Pathankot is the Himalaya mountain range. And when they woke up that morning in the middle of lockdown, they saw the beauty of the Himalayas for the first time in 30 years. And the reason they saw that image for the first time in 30 years is because the lockdown had cleared the pollution that normally obliterates that view in India. And when I saw this image posted on LinkedIn, the phrase that came into my mind, the quote that came into my mind was from the author, Mark Proust, who said that the real bridge of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in seeing with new eyes. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in seeing with new eyes. And when those villagers woke up that morning in April, they saw with new eyes. The Himalayas had already always been there. For the last three, 30 years, they've always been there, but they haven't seen that mountain range. But with the clearing of the pollution, they saw with new eyes. And for me, that's the symbolic opportunity that we are uh, faced with now. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Almost a million people have died globally. Um, depending upon the perspective we take, there is a lot of suffering, there is a lot of grief, there is a lot of confusion and anger. But there also is a perspective from which we can see possibilities, silver linings, new opportunities. And I want to encourage you to, to try and find that perspective of that, that silver lining this evening. Because the symbolic um, message of this picture is that that pollution that blocked the vision of the Himalayas is a product of the industrial age, the industrial way of working that we have lived with for hundreds of years that has given us many great things but has also given us pollution and has also given us inequality and has also given us ecological challenges and social issues and 
this uh, clearing of the smog, this clearing of the pollution, for me, it's symbolic of the transition that we are in from the industrial age to the social age. And in seeing with new eyes, uh, regardless of this pandemic, I want to encourage you to recognize that we were already in a great transition. We were already undergoing together something significant in terms of a change in perspective on our world of work. And that this pandemic is simply accelerating what was already in place. And the opportunity for us all, I think, is to see with new eyes, to embrace the social age, but also to let go of some of the things that we got attached to in the industrial age. Now, I'm currently reading a book which I wish I'd written. Amy said that the second edition of my own book, The Trusted Executive, will come literally next week. That's very exciting. Uh, but it's also exciting when you read a book and you think, boy, I wish I'd written this book. And the book that I'm reading at the moment is called Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. Uh, now, we've all probably heard Simon Sinek, Gary Vee, and all the, the gurus that we follow on Twitter and LinkedIn. But I want you to check out Kate Raworth, and I want you to think about this book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 20th Century economic, e Economist. Because Kate, Kate Raworth in this book dismantles um, the traditional economic um, perspective of the industrial age. What she says in this book is that the industrial age was characterized by a myopic, myopic focus on a single measure of success called gross domestic product, GDP. And if you've done your economics module in your MBA, as I did in 1988, you will know how hardwired GDP is into the consciousness of our measures of success and progress. And not only is it wired in at the national level, it's wired in at the company and the institutional level. We've all become uh, very much entranced by this singular goal of gross domestic product. And of course, it has given us some great things. That singular simplicity has driven a level of progress in the last 150 years that we can see a lot of benefit from. But it's also introduced some risks. And this donut uh, economics that Kate Raworth talks about says that the risks are introduced at two levels. There is risk of overshooting the ecological ceiling of our planet. And there's a risk of under of a shortfall in the social foundations of our society. So she talks about 12 social foundations and nine ecological ceilings that are at risk unless we change our perspective, unless we see with new eyes in terms of our economic thinking. And rather than pursuing GDP as that simplistic measure of success, Kate Raworth suggests that we should actually be exploring this space in the donut called the safe and just space for humanity. So as we see with new eyes, uh, in this new world of work, we have to think about purpose and mission. Is our purpose GDP or is our purpose to create a safe and just space for humanity? And if you think about what is happening at the moment with the pandemic, for the first time in human history, we have chosen safety over GDP. We would never have locked down an economy back in 1918 in the middle of the Spanish flu pandemic, which claimed 80 million lives globally but we are locking down nations in this pandemic because we appear to be making choices based on different value judgments. And one of those values judgments is about the value of a human life. Another big issue that we've all been caught up with globally this year is the issue of Black Lives Matter. And a just space for humanity, a just space for humanity implies that all lives matter, that we need to create a justice around that as well as a safety. And I think we can see that there is an increasing pressure to consider these issues at least alongside, if not in greater importance than economic uh, progress and GDP alone. And so we are, I think, at this transition point and that the pandemic is accelerating our opportunity to see with new eyes. And a lot of us will have been working from home these last months. Uh, we will have found that different, unusual, maybe disturbing, maybe uh, depressing at times. But we'll have also seen again, new opportunities from that remote way of working. And I had a fascinating discussion on Friday, actually with Richard Billingham, the HR director at Aston University. 
Rich is a great sort of thinker and, and uh, debater around the future world of work. And he articulated to me in that conversation on Friday that he saw the factors that will come together and start to architect a new world of work in this social age. On the one hand, we have technology. On the one hand, we have a, an innovative use of physical space. And on the other hand, we have a culture and people and processes that these things together can create what I um, have heard termed the ROWE, the results only working environment. That in the social age, uh, we may actually create a dynamic working environment which will involve breaking down the remaining building blocks of scientific management of Taylorism where everything was a factory and everyone was an agent of production and need, it needed to be managed as such. I think we're on the brink of, of dismantling a few more blocks of that Tayloristic paradigm and we will replace it with a dynamic working environment, a results only working environment where we focused on outputs. What you do and how you do it and where you do it will be very much more empowered to the individual. And um, one of the forerunners of uh, of this sort of new way of working uh, is, is Facebook. And, and last week I came across a, an advert um, for a director of remote working for Facebook. And I just want to read you the job description for the director of remote working at Facebook. Facebook is taking a thoughtful and measured approach to the future of work, including committing to remote work as one of our long-term strategies. We're seeking a director remote work to lead this strategy and partner with an extensive group of cross-functional partners to make this shift to the way we design our organizations and grow our people. The director of remote work will be a strategic thinker who understands distributed and virtual teams, a standing relationship builder and a change agent. Our ideal candidate is someone who can collective, collaboratively build on and involve our remote workforce strategy with a passion and proven acumen for experience, design, process excellence and change management. So that's a strategic role. This isn't about working from home. This is about creating a dynamic working environment. And if Facebook are appointing people into strategic roles like that, then I think we can expect more and more organizations are gonna to start to want to have people at board level who are really thinking through this challenge and really architecting, architecting that new way of work. So, um, that, those three aspects, the technology, the physical space, the culture, the results of any working environment. Of course, it's only going to work if we have a leadership style that is appropriate to that new world of work. My own passion um, is trust, uh, this word trust. Uh, in 2016, I founded the Trusted Executive Foundation, a not-for-profit whose mission is to put trust at the heart of leadership using the research from Aston Business School and the Nine Habits of Trust. And our purpose is captured in this quote from Charles Green, that in the social age, um, leaders can no longer trust in power. Instead, they must rely upon the power of trust. So the currency of leadership in the industrial age was power. But the currency of leadership in the social age must be trust. And for most of us, like myself, who were brought up in the industrial age, who are conditioned in the leadership of power, it means unlearning habits. I need to unlearn the habits of power, but I need to learn the habits of trust. And to learn those habits, I first need a good model and I secondly need um, some practice. And those will be the focus of our next two sprints. But I'm 20 minutes in, so I wanna stop sprint one and I wanna open it up um, to ask some, some questions and invite you to, to share some questions at this big picture level of seeing with new eyes. Okay, thank you very much for that, John. Um, I've got a question in the chat from Andrew. Andrew asks, is there not a rise in ultimate Taylorism with everything measured with technology and working from home? Hasn't this been speeded up by lockdown? Mm, thank you for that question. Um, yes, I mean, um, and depending upon the leadership culture, then um, these, these, these trends, these situations can be used for different ends. And there are some, I think, in the midst of this um, transition, there will be some leaders and some organizations 
that fight very hard to keep the culture of, of Taylorism, the culture of scientific management. And yes, they can use technology to monitor people at home um, and they can use uh, technology to exercise um, greater power in terms of that cultural model. But I think we have to then uh, ask ourselves, um, you know, where is the top talent going to uh, migrate to? You know, um, where is the, the choice that we have um, in the modern world, the choice that a lot of us have in the modern world, uh, we can exercise that choice. Uh, and my, my gambit is that more and more talent and more and more customers will exercise the choice to work with high trust cultures in the coming years. And those that don't go down that path will increasingly risk being exposed by the media. And we've seen many high profile cases of this where brands, brands will get trashed very, very quickly um, in this new world of work uh, and will get exposed because we live in a very transparent world. One of the things that kept the place together was a lack of transparency and opaqueness, which allowed uh, a, a, an uneven distribution of power to exist. Uh, for, for a long period of time. But in, in this uh, social age, um, because of education, technology, globalization, we're living in a much more transparent environment. And I think that transparency will expose um, leaders and cultures that are still relying on, on power. And that over time, and, and I'm not saying this is going to happen in 24 hours, we're around the world, but I'm just saying to you that over time, I think the trend is towards uh, high trust cultures high trust brands uh, and for me that is a cause for optimism um, and, but all, all of us have a choice around whether we're part of the problem or part of the solution around this this shift. Thank you for the question. Hey, we've got questions coming thick and fast. Um, Nikki has asked about uh, Roe and there's also a bit on Roe from Mark as well. So Nikki would like to kind of understand a bit more about how we leverage new working practices to stimulate innovation and creativity when one of the challenges of Roe is that it sounds quite transactional. And Mark has built on that by asking about how we transition to Roe and what kind of training organisations need to change their culture. Thank you both of you for, for picking picking up on that, that Roe uh, uh, acronym. Um, what I'm going to suggest with those questions is that we that we take them over into the next two sprints because very much the next two sprints is is me looking to to answer those those questions. So um, what sort of habits and behaviours and models will allow the results only work environment to be high trust human environment rather than a, a low trust transactional environment? Um, so that's that's very much where uh, I'll be going next. So what I, what I would say. Um, uh, is, is if, if at the end of the next sprint you still have the same question then please please ask it me again but if we can um, if we can do it then I think we'll have a, a, a model that we can use maybe to talk about that in a in a in a richer way so I hope that, hope you don't think I'm just uh, stuck in a question can you can hold me to account a bit later in the session no that's perfect John thank you um we've had a very interesting question from Liz, who says that women executives have been developing trust based approaches for decades, but have often yeah. lost out in the power based structures in the social age. Is it time for women leaders or is that a thing that we need to be considering? Absolutely, I, I'd say a big, huge yes to that. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, um, clearly in the industrial age, there were those who had power uh, and there were those who didn't. And, and uh, those who didn't have power actually found other strategies to influence things. And so I think those that have had to rely upon influence and trust, um, even in the industrial age, uh, will find that they're an at an advantage as we move into this um, social age of work. So, yeah, I think part of the diversity and inclusion initiative, we should think of it as um, as, as what are effective leadership habits in this social age and, and who, who has mastered them. Uh, and if, if there are certain um, groups and, uh, you know, that, have mastered, that happen to have mastered these habits better, then of course um, we want to learn from those and we want to uh, have those um, showcased in, in our leadership roles. And of course the flip side of the question 
is that those like me uh, who benefited from the world of power, so white uh, men of a certain age like me who benefited from the world of power, we have the most to unlearn um, and we have the most to lose. Um, and so we ask that you treat us with compassion around that challenge and that you give us time uh, to, uh, to unlearn what we need to learn and to uh, uh, learn the, the new habits. So I think we're all, we're all going to be caught up in different transitions. Um, and uh, one of the things we're going to need is a lot of uh, compassion and tolerance um, for the different challenges that we all face as we get into this, this new world. And some of the habits I'm going to talk about later will also um, allude to that and we'll come back to that. But, but thank you for, for pointing out that because I don't talk directly about gender in this uh, work. But I think, again, um, you know, it's, it, it's self-evident. I talk more about power and trust, but it's self-evident that you can follow those lines of thinking and, and, and arrive at gender challenges uh, and, and gender issues quite, quite quickly. Fantastic. And you've had some applause in the chat box for your responses to that question as well. So much appreciation. We've got questions coming thick and fast and I'm conscious yeah, of your time more. as well. So just, just take, maybe just take one more, um, Amy. OK, one more then. So this yeah, one you, comes you, you from come from Davy Zakal who says, and apologies for the pronunciation there, um, trust as a factor is subject to popular culture. We live in a day and age where political alignments are now being seen as good versus bad, which spills over into business. For instance, calls for boycotts to business who do not align to popular political or cultural ideologies, even when brands have been trusted over time. What's your view on that distinction there? So just, just the distinction we're looking at, Amy, is the distinction between just just uh, just give me another summary of that question. So trust is due to popular culture. So that element of trust. Well, I, I would, yeah. Yeah, pro probably, we're, we're probably. Probably I'm going to dispute that first um, phrase. Trust is a, is a product of popular culture. Um, again, in, in, in the. In the work that I'm going to share in the next sprint, I'm going to share a module that's a product of empirical research, uh, not popular culture around trust. Now, there are cultural nuances around that model and those habits, but I'm not sure that I would subscribe to saying that trust is a product of popular culture. I think if, if you if you start from that place, then yes, you get into some into some quite weird um, positions quite quickly, because if trust is also something that is post truth. And, and, a, and a product of popular culture, then then it then it uh, it doesn't serve a purpose as a as a sort of a, as a compass and a, and a true bearing for us. But but I, but in the model of trust that I'm um, focused on, um, I'm hoping that it's based on something more more solid than popular culture. Great, thank you very much, John. There's one more um, that I'd like to just throw at you before you move on, which is from Claire. And you may cover this in the next section, but just as kind of context, when do we see the tipping point at which people believe we are no longer in a temporary position and we'll head back to a status quo and accept that we've moved into a social age or a new way of being? Mm, yeah, great question. I mean, apparently they say that 17 percent of a population needs to move. Um, before um, that in order for that tipping point to to be reached you know that 17 percent of the population need to need to have uh, have made the step now I think um, you know what I would say on that is that different if I look at it from a business perspective different business sectors are some sectors are moving quicker than others um, and then if I look at countries some countries are moving uh, quicker than others into this into this social age so I think um, there are different paces of movement. There are different. Um, uh, there are three steps forwards, and then there are two steps back. Um, I think it's a very fluid, dynamic um, situation. But I suppose, um, you know, for us, every one of us on this webinar, the most important question is where do we stand? When the moment comes for you to speak, uh, we speak in on behalf of the industrial age, or will you speak? on behalf of the social age. So for me as a coach, as an executive coach, I'm really focused on the individual and the individual opportunity 
Um, and so I would just encourage us all to think about which world do we want to live in and which world do we want our grandchildren to live in. And when the moment comes to lead and to have a choice and to influence, um, that we uh, focus on our role in being part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. To me, that's an empowering um, perspective. Um, and then we let everybody else, you know, uh, make their own choice. But as leaders, we hope that we might influence one or two people along the way. And that's how we get from A to B. OK, I'm going to move on, Amy. Perfect. Thank you very much. OK, so thank you for your questions. Um, we could obviously stay there and talk a lot more uh, about that, but I, I want to move on to Sprint 2. So Sprint 2, it, if we've seen with new eyes and, and we recognize that there's uh, a need to lead with new habits, then Sprint 2 is all about, well, what are these new ha habits? What's the theory of these new habits that might be a roadmap, a template for us to follow if we want to be um, relying on the power of trust. So I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, back in 1985, I joined a company called British Gas here in the West Midlands as a graduate trainee. And I was very naive, but I was very ambitious. And I walked into this organization. I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, and I had to work it out very quickly. Now, I had a degree in chemistry and they put me in the marketing department. But you see, it didn't really matter because what they really wanted to know was, did I have a brain? Because I realized I'd walked into a, a temple of business that was held up by, by one of those sacred pillars was intellectual ability. Does he have a brain? Yes, he does. Take Right, we'll put him in the marketing department. Next thing was, um, we need to give him some authority. First job I had, I was called customer service officer. So I had my authority. And the idea was that I, with my slightly bigger brain and authority, could tell you what to do in service of the God of this temple, which was the single bottom line of profit. So I, I didn't I couldn't conceptualize this at the time, but instinctively, this is this is the model that I realized I was part of. This is the game that I thought I'd been asked to play. And I didn't realize this game had been was was the product of 19th century economic thinking. Uh, I, just, I just I didn't know any different. So, you, you know, you put someone like me in an environment like that and all I'm going to do is optimize the game um, because, um, as Kate Raworth says, you know, if you put me in a game like that and you expect me, rational economic man, to be homo economicus, that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to calculate. I'm going to focus on profit of money and I'm going to self optimize. And as she very powerfully says in her book, who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. So beware, rational economic man, the selfie at the heart of economics. I didn't realize that when I joined British Gas, they were training me to be rational economic man, the selfie at the heart of economics. But it got into me and it soaked into me and I learned all the habits and I maximized it because I was ambitious and I wanted to win. And this seemed to be like the game that had been presented to me. So that is the sort of um, uh, the implication of this economic thinking of the industrial age. That's how it affects individual people. We become homo economicus. And that's what I think have become. Now, again, I don't want to go moralize about this. I don't want to judge it. I just want to sort of say, can we accept that that was just the way it was? Now, I want to invite you in this new way of thinking to think about that we're architecting a new temple of business because not enough people want to worship GDP or profit anymore. So we need a new God in that temple. And Kate Raworth talks about her donor economics. In my book, I talk about this, you know, triple bottom line, which some of you may have heard of, that we're moving from the single bottom line of profit as the measure of business success to the bottom line of profit, people and planet or results, relationships, and reputation, as I like to talk about it, because I just think it's a little bit more down to earth. If you change the God in the temple and you start worshiping something different, then it changes a huge amount of things in terms of the nature of the game. And we shift from being homo economicus to being homo sapiens, that is measuring success in a very different way. Now, of course, 
if intellectual ability alone and authority are no longer the sacred pillars, they're no longer the sticky enough glue to hold us all together, then we need some new glue at the heart of this, of this model. And um, that glue is the super glue of trust. But for most of us, it's not trust as we've known it. Most of us have been playing at the edges of trust. Most of us have been relying upon authority much, much more than we ever realized. Um, so it's like this trust 2.0. We, we've got to build this trust from, from the beginning because I'm about to show you a slide which, which some of you might find it, um, offensive because this is, a, this is what trust meant in the industrial age. It was two men in suits shaking hands, shaking white hands to do a deal. And that was the symbol of trust. That is the most powerful symbol of trust of the industrial age. Now, of course, we right now are in a situation where we don't shake hands. We don't wear suits. And there are many, many different um, and diverse and inclusive um, brains and uh, resources coming to bear on all our challenges. So this picture is an offensive picture. It's offensive at many levels because it's symbolic of that industrial age. But, but one of the benefits of this picture at the time when it was acceptable was that trust had been codified. Trust had been codified into what you wear. It had been codified into the way you shook hands and all little rituals that occupied office life. So trust was sort of codified to the extent that we needed it in that particular environment. But what I'm going to suggest in this new world of work, in this results only work environment that we are now creating, is that we need to create trust, not from symbols and rituals, but from raw principles. And we know from the academic research that the raw pillars of trust are ability, integrity and benevolence. If we want to build cultures on trust that support the triple bottom line, then these are the three pillars that we need to focus on. We need to be competent at what we do. We need to walk the talk of our values. And then we need this benevolence, this common human care, compassion, kindness um, to bind our culture together. And the formula for that trust, trustworthiness is not ability, add integrity, add benevolence. It's ability times integrity times benevolence. And the maths gives you an opportunity and a risk because the risk is if you score zero on any one of those pillars in the social age we will not trust you but if you get into the upper quartile on all three pillars then big numbers apply by big numbers to create an even bigger trust quotient so I could be fantastically able at what I do I could be as honest as the day is long but if I, if I am routinely negligent or careless about my stakeholders and I score zero on that benevolence pillar, then I won't be trusted. And it's the benevolence pillar that most intrigues me as a business leader because I have never been on the course, you know, the introduction to benevolence course for senior leaders. I mean, benevolence is not a word I've seen in any leadership competency framework in the last 20 years. And yet the theory tells us it's a critical pillar of trust but I think you're going to find that benevolence word that caring word that compassion that kindness you're going to see it creeping into the business lexicon in the coming years because it has to come in if we're going to build cultures with this type of trust so I think that's again a very interesting and hopefully exciting possibility that we might be insourcing benevolence back into the workplace you might sort of be quite aghast that we ever outsourced it but the industrial age didn't need it Strictly speaking, it didn't need it. The social age does need it if it's going to be powered by this type of currency of trust. Now, my own research at Aston, um, the ability, integrity, benevolence pillars have been in the literature of trust for, for many, many years. So there's nothing new about that, although many practicing leaders might not know that formula. But my own research, because I'm an executive coach, I wanted to get at the behavioral habits of trust. Now, I used to coach leaders and I'd get to the point where they'd say, yeah, John, I'm a believer in trust. I want to stand for trust. Uh, now, how do I do it? And I could give them the ability, integrity, benevolence, but they'd say, no, yeah, but what, how, what does that mean in practice? And I didn't really have a good answer to that question. Um, so that's why 
uh, in my DBA program at Aston Business School, I focused on identifying the nine behavioral habits of trust. So through a mixed methods research, which involved interviewing over 50 chief executives uh, and then surveying over 500 leaders and doing all the things you have to do as part of that rigorous academic um, path, out of that research emerged nine habits, three habits of ability, three habits of integrity, and three habits of benevolence. So I can share with this you as a definition of trust, not from popular culture, but a definition of trust from empirical research. And I hope that gives you confidence in it. I hope that al allows you to feel that it's, it's, it's a rock that has some substance um, because, because we need it to have um, that substance if we're going to rely upon it. I'm going to quickly run through these habits um, for you, and I'm going to compare and contrast the habits of trust with the habits of power, the habits of the social age with the habits of the industrial age. And then when we've uh, done that little tour of the nine habits, I'm going to pause from this sprint and we'll take a few more uh, questions. So three habits of ability. Deliver. I think in the world of, of power, you know, we needed to deliver to be trusted. Um, and we still need to deliver in the social age. So I think um, being competent and capable at what you do, delivering on time to budget, to quality, that hasn't changed. It's a habit we've needed to have, and I think it's a habit we'll st still need to have in the social age. But the habit of coaching, habit number two, in the industrial world, I told you what to do with my slightly bigger brain. And enough people bought into the myth of the slightly bigger brain that it worked enough of the time. In the social world, um, people don't want to be told what to do anymore. A lot of people have stopped believing in the myth of the slight the bigger brain. Um, and what they want now is not to be told, but they want to be asked. They want to be listened to. They want to be empowered. And that's a collection of skill we actually now in business call coaching. Coaching is a word that wasn't even in business language 20 years ago, but now it's a mainstream tool of business um, because it's a tool of the social age. So that's habit number two, coaching. Habit number three, not the most glamorous of the nine habits, I'll give you that, but nothing destroys trust as quickly as unpredictability of behavior. If I don't know where I stand in relation to you, then I, I'm gonna find it very difficult to trust you. So being consistent is a key habit of this model of trust that what you say and what you do and what you think are aligned and that there is a consistency about the decision making the good days the bad days and all the other spots in between so that consistency that reliability that predictability behavior key habit of trust three habits of integrity be honest be open be humble so be honest is an aspiration that I think leaders had in the industrial age, but the lack of transparency covered up many a mistake in honesty. In a very transparent world that we live in now, the bar on honesty is going to be higher because the risks of being exposed are greater. So the bar on honesty is a bit more ruthless uh, than it used to be. Being open. This is a habit that I'm working on myself because I as an alpha male leader in the industrial age was not really encouraged to show weakness um, the idea in the industrial age is if you showed weakness somebody would exploit it and use it against you because that's how power works but actually in the trust game being open showing some vulnerability not being perfect but being fallible and occasionally making a mistake and actually admitting to that is actually a very endearing human quality and in this model of trust, that's what brings and inspires trust, is being open in the right place at the right time. The third habit of the integrity pillar, be humble. So in industrial age, if you were successful um, and you were arrogant, we probably think that was a fair deal. Not all of us would have thought that, but a lot of us would have thought, yeah, okay, we'll put up with the arrogance as long as you're successful. In the social age, what I'm noticing is that we don't seem to want to put up with that anymore, that we're actually expecting to meet people on a level, regardless of how successful they may or may not have been. 
and therefore that humility, that humble leadership is a very inspiring leader of trust because it implies wholeness of, of that integrity. Finally, three habits of benevolence. First habit is the word uh, evangelize, and de depending on which part of the world you are in, that might be a word that um, is, is easy to understand or not easy to understand. Um, but evangelize uh, has, a, has a religious uh, meaning, but also has a secular meaning which, meaning, which is about spreading the good news. Great evangelists in business uh, have an inspiring biz, uh, vision. They love what they do. They bounce back from disappointments. And that's what powers them in terms of a future vision. And that inspires trust in the people around them. So that's that habit of evangelizing. Being brave, habit number eight, we're not talking here about the physical, personal bravery of the industrial age, but we're talking about the moral bravery of the social age. The slightly strange idea that at some point in the cycle, the leader self-sacrifices on behalf of the wider good. And when you're in the presence of that, boy, does it inspire trust. It just it doesn't happen that often. And finally, last but not, not least, habit number nine, this awful word kindness. If I'd have used the word kindness in the boardroom of British Gas all those years ago, I think they would have hounded me out of the building. You know, what's kindness got to do with leadership? Um, well, it turns out from the research that kindness is one of the nine habits of trust, and trust is the one thing that changes everything. So kindness um, is, again, a habit that I'm working on myself personally because I've never, again, never, ne never been tutored or mentored uh, in kindness. Um, but I'm finding somewhat late in life that kindness is a really powerful thing. And you might look at me thinking I've been living on a different planet for 50 odd years. But honestly, I am really discovering that kindness is like a power tool of leadership. Um, and, I, and I liken it now to a purple dye. You know, all it takes is one drop and it changes the whole complexion and color of a situation. And uh, fantastic um, habit, fantastic tool of leadership. The only thing is you can't fake it, can you? I mean, you know, you have to be genuine. I mean, you, obviously you have to be genuine and, you know, if you're not genuine, you, you know, it's not going to work. So, you know, it's not something we can fake, um, but if we can find it in ourselves, um, then it is one of these nine habits of, of trust. So that's a very quick tour of the nine habits. In the final sprint, I'm going to pull out four habits and actually just hone in and focus in on some practical um tools and and, uh, and experiences that I'm noticing in leaders that we're working with right now that, that could be helpful to share. Um, but I just want to pause it there and um, finish sprint two and just open it up um, for any questions around the theory of these nine habits, the theory of um, the shift um, to this new model, uh, the ability, integrity, benevolence, pillars and the nine habits. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that, John. Um, Liz has asked how your research and how this theory relates to research into sociopathic tendencies, uh, which often dominated within the traditional power structures, um, those traits being opposite to trust. So is there anything that you've done in that space looking at the different theories there? I haven't um, I haven't done anything academically in terms of looking at um, you know the the, the, the behaviours of sociopaths if you like and, and and analysing and and mapping them to to this model I, I can only sort of uh, comment more anecdotally really as a as a as a business leader on uh, in the in the new edition of uh, of my book the trusted executive um, what I've included actually in, in the new edition is is um, nine habits that are the opposite of these um habits so for for example um and you could you could imagine that those nine habits are probably the habits of a sociopath um and if you look at them it's quite interesting because if you look at the habit evangelize and you think okay what's the opposite of the evangelized habit i mean we know what the opposite of the honest habit is it's being dishonest some of them are easier to uh, to map than others you know the opposite of being consistent is being unpredictable um, the opposite of delivering is not delivering. The, the one I found most interesting is the opposite of evangelize. What is the opposite of, of evangelize? And actually, um, when I did a bit of work on this, I concluded that the opposite of it was manipulation. That actually the opposite of the evangelize tablet is, is, is manipulating. That if you've got that charismatic 
um, uh, energy and style, either use it to evangelize or you can use it to manipulate. And in the world of power uh, and in the world of, of, of a sociopath, um, you use that charisma to manipulate. I mean, that, you know, that, that's how you would apply that gift. But in the world of trust, the way you apply that gift is to evangelize. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think we can um, we can certainly see the relationship between some of these habits and look at the opposites. And then we, we think about words like sociopath or psychopath. And, um, you know, there was a piece of research, I think, that, you know, so that 20 percent of CEOs, uh, you know, have got, have got psychopathic tendencies. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, based on my experience, I'm not I, I wouldn't necessarily dispute that. And I've, and I've probably got one or two of them myself. Um, because you have to remember that's what we were taught. That's the way it was, you know. I mean, we didn't even have a word like psychopath um, back in the 1980s, you know, and we didn't we didn't use language like that. So we were completely blind to this, um, you know. And that's the thing about seeing with new eyes, you know. We we were completely blind, um, and and a lot of this is a bit of a revelation to a lot of us, and um, we're having to work it all out a bit. And um, you know, it, it, that's why I think it's going to take us a bit of time to really. Um, process support. Thanks for the question. Great. Thanks for that, John. Um, Don asked a bit earlier, it was before this sprint, but I think it's interesting from a theoretical perspective. He talked about whether putting management by objectives and self-managing teams was coming to the fore as a result of this shift to the social age, or whether you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's very true. I mean, I think a lot of these trends were in place before the pandemic. So self-managing teams, management by objectives, empowerment, distributed leadership, servant leadership. You know, a lot of these um, thoughts and, and theories uh, and practices were, were beginning to bubble away anyway. And the world of work already changing. Um, but I think what what the pandemic um, has done is is accelerate the whole um, cycle, um, and it's made me realise probably more than I than I did before how how um, little progress we've actually made uh, in down that path. I mean, we've been talking about empowerment for 15 years, but the the level of empowerment that uh, that's actually being practised in most organisations is pitiful, um, and I think I think this pandemic. It's forced us in the same way we all suddenly got used to working on Zoom and Teams in the space of seven days. I think as leaders, we suddenly got used to empowering people in seven days and we suddenly realized what it really means. Um, and so I think that is the accelerator that's happening. And the opportunity is to, to, is to accelerate. Um, of course, there is the counter uh, uh, opportunity, which is a reactive, that we react, there's a reactive. Um, uh, response to uh, what we've seen everybody gets scared everybody gets worried and we go back 10 years um, and that, that's where I think now it's important to have these conversations it's important for everybody as I said before webinar to think this through and make choices around it because we might not get a chance like this um, for, for quite a long time Brilliant. thank you um there are quite a few comments coming in and there's some really good discussion in the chat box between the, the guests here tonight so that's brilliant um one of the things that michael has been talking quite a lot about is application of different leadership styles depending what global culture you're operating in and how some might be more or less resistant to traits such as openness or um, being kind and i wonder if you had any views on that yeah, great. That's a great um, uh, topic to, to open up. Um, I've shared this model in, in many different um, countries around, around the world. So over the last four years, I've shared it um, in Canada, in America, going west. Uh, I've shared it in Europe, and I've also shared it in um, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, um, at the Middle East. And, and uh, whilst, whilst it was not at the scope of my research to look at the cross-cultural implications, there are other researchers who have looked at, at this. And in fact, there was a recent article in Harvard Business Review all about the, um, the, the differences of trust to cultures. And the way I would map it onto this model is that what, I've, what, what I would say if I was just summarizing the cultural um, lens on this is that I think all nine habits are relevant in all parts of the world. 
but I think the relative um, importance of them varies. And what I've noticed, for example, that as, as you go east, I, I've noticed that, um, you know, the habits of, of kindness, I actually find the habit of, of kindness um, gets stronger uh, in my experience. This is anecdotal, uh, but it's also backed up by some of some of the research uh, that I've read that, that you get that, that benevolence pillar gets stronger as you go east. Now, what I've noticed as well is as you go west, this is west from the UK, that being honest and being open, uh, uh, you know, get, gets gets stronger. Uh, evangelize probably gets stronger. You know, we can think of, of some great evangelists from 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 the from the you know that th those cultures um as you go east i think the be humble habit gets stronger um so i think i think there are definitely cultural um nuances around the model um and but i think all nine are are worth worthy of thought in every culture and of course you know you have to then think about the direction of travel because the other thing I notice as I share this model around the world is there is a generation coming through that doesn't have the same national uh, biases that, that my generation has. There, there is a generation coming through that I think is more global that actually um, uh, adopts a, a, a more generic um, definition of values and of things like trust. Um, so I think that that generation is also bringing with it um, a, a different global consciousness around these sorts of topics but this is me talking anecdotally I'm not talking as someone who has researched those things but I'm sure that as I say there are there are quite a lot of research out there if people want to uh, to look at the um, the different cultural nuances of, uh, of trust maybe take one one more uh, on Amy and then uh, we'll, we'll move on Perfect. So a few people have talked about different levels within the organisation and how they respond perhaps to these nine habits. So do you have any views on how you embed the nine working practices, the nine habits of trust from the bottom up as well as from a leadership perspective? Well, the focus of my research was on CEOs and, and board level leaders. So uh, um, this model has been developed from looking at the the habits and behaviors of what inspires trust from board level leaders because and the other part of the research scope was to look at the impact of that those behaviors at, at ceo board level on the culture of the business uh, and what i found from that research is, is one of the most significant predictors of a high trust culture is the behavior of the ceo and the senior leadership team now you might think well that's obvious but you know, leading by example and, and role modeling are powerful levers of influence. Um, but it's one thing to think of that in sort of common sense. It's another thing to demonstrate it in terms of uh, hard, hard science and, and research. Um, so m my sort of focus has been upon that board level because I think those leaders um, leading by example and role modeling can ripple out these behaviors into a culture. Uh, and then that is a powerful lever of change. Now, having said that, the clients that we work with at the Trusting Foundation, where we're using this model now to uh, to train uh, teams uh, to work with this, to use it as a language. You know, we have a survey tool based on this model. We have a 360 feedback based on this model, uh, and so we are seeing organisations now using this at, at uh, more junior levels in the organisation, um, and and using it to help uh, all levels of, uh, of staff. Uh, build trust and, and be influencers, be effective influencers, sometimes influencing up the organization, sometimes influencing outside the organization, sometimes influencing their teams. But I think there's there's more scope to look at it um, as that broader sort of uh, tool, um, as opposed to my focus is very much on that, that senior leadership population. Thank you, thank you for your, your questions. Um, half past six, uh, time to, uh, to move into that last sprint. Um, so final 15, 20 minute sprints and uh, one or two questions and I'm, I'm really keen to, uh, to let you get away on, uh, on time. Um, so the final sprint is um, leading with new habits, the practice of that. And, and what I want to do in this final sprint is just pull out four habits, uh, four habits and, and share with you just a practical tip that 
we are observing when we're working with models with this, these leaders, particularly in the current times, in the crisis, in the pandemic, how might you use this model and what are the immediate practical tips that we could draw from it? And the habits I'm going to look at are the habit number one of deliver. I'm going to look at the habit um, of being, uh, of evangelizing. I'm going to look at the habit of, of being brave. And I'm going to look at the habit of being humble. So I'm going to look at deliver, humble, evangelize, and brave. It just happened to be the four um, that uh, I think at the moment there are some interesting things to say about. So let me talk first about being brave. So being brave. Um, so a 22-year-old black footballer called Marcus Rashford, who plays for Manchester United, his job is to score goals. His job is not to influence topics like child poverty in the UK. But he didn't care what his job was. He wanted to influence um, a topic that he was passionate about because of his own upbringing and his own experience. He wanted to influence the topic of child poverty in this country, in the UK. And he was brave enough to speak out and to write a letter to our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, that in 24 hours effected change um, that, that our parliament had not been able to deliver, you know, in the, in the many months uh, before that. And on the day when he um, delivered that policy change, uh, he tweeted out, I don't even know what to say. Just look at what we can do when we come together. This is England in 2020. And when I read that tweet, I thought, yeah, this is England in 2020. It's not 2000. It's not 1985. It's not 1945. It's 2020. You know, and so what is appropriate now? You know, in 2020, what should we be expecting at the beginning of this decade? So I, my challenge to leaders that I work with at the moment is I talk about in their inner Marcus Rashford. And what I mean by that is what is the topic that you need to be brave enough to speak out about right now? Because now is the time to find that voice. If there's ever been a time to find your voice and to speak, then it's now uh, because there is a hunger for it. There is an appetite for it. Now you still have to be brave. It doesn't mean to say that it's easy. It doesn't mean to say that you won't sort of uh, shaking your boots at the time when you, when you do what you feel you need to do. But I really want to encourage everybody on this webinar to think about where they might be brave right now in order to speak up on behalf of the new world of work, the social age, the future, because it is 2020. And surely that must mean something in terms of where we are on our timeline of progress and aspiration. So that's the habit of being brave, a benevolent habit, moral bravery. Um, this is a very practical habit, deliver. Uh, so what, what we're picking up at the moment with the teams that are working with, the leadership teams that we're working with as the Trusted Executive Foundation, um, we're, we're experiencing a contraction in the planning horizon of the delivery habit. So whereas we used to talk about 12 month business plans, three year visions, um, we're finding now that leaders are very much focusing on this more agile mindset of sprints. So I've done it this evening, I've, not, I've had three sprints. Um, you know, the, the energy that we need to maintain in this virtual world that's in crisis where you can't predict the future, it's easier to maintain motivation and energy if you're sprinting rather than if you're sort of walking a marathon. You know, it's easy to sprint and pause, sprint and pause, sprint and pause. Um, now, my son works for a company called Kanos, it's a software development company, and they use this agile scrum methodology that some of you will have will have heard, heard of. So in the technology sector, this agile way of working, this agile way of delivery, is quite established. They do two week sprints every day as a 10 o'clock stand up where they check in in terms of what have they done? What are they planning to do? Any blocks at the end of each sprint, they have a retro and they review that delivery package and then they plan the next package and they go again. And I just think this agile way of working is going to spread out um, and, and influence more and more sectors um, in these in these uncertain times um, because it's it's much easier to motivate and engage people if you're working on that much shorter 
time horizon. You go out 12 months and people just start to roll their eyes because look what happened in the last 12 months. Um, so it's, uh, I think the delivery message is very much about agility and building those agile working methods. And of course the scrum master, my, my, my son's business, they have a scrum master that looks after the team. Well, actually that's another word for a coach. I mean, that scrum master is using all the coaching skills. Um, so they don't have a boss. They have like a scrum master. And that's, 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 that's is that type of, of, of work in the, with, 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 the, with the habit of delivery, but also the habit of coaching. So uh, another uh, client uh, of mine is a really great example of, uh, of this evangelized habit. Um, so the, the, the guy you can see on this, on this picture here is, uh, is a guy called Richard Hyams. I worked with him for, for many years as a, as a coach. He's been a member of our trusted executive uh, fellowship board, and he, he runs an architect practice in London. And he was telling me a story the other day, um, which I thought captured the evangelized habit right now uh, very powerfully. He said that his sister had gone to look at a house and was house hunting like a lot of people in the UK are at the moment. Uh, they went house hunting and they visited the house. They came out of the house and they, um, his sister turned to, to her husband and said, um, well, what do you think? Uh, and the response from the husband was, uh, the, the, the response from the husband was, I don't know. And uh, what do you think? And um, his sister said, well, uh, sure, but it's either got to be a no or a hell yeah. It's either got to be a no or a hell yeah. And I, and I think this really captures um, a, a bit of an attitude at the moment. You know, uh, whatever you're doing at the moment, you know, I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Uh, you know, we're in a really difficult times. So you, you could be struggling with all sorts of things. But, you know, when you think about your vision and your mission, uh, and what's important to you, it's either got to be a no or a hell yeah. I mean, get yourself caught in the middle ground of the yes, maybe. Either get out or commit. It's either got to be a no or a hell yeah. And if it isn't a hell yeah, if you're waking up at the moment and it's not a hell yeah, let me at it, then how could you make it a hell yeah? Because sometimes that's a, that's a state of mind. You know, so, sometimes you can find the hell yeah in the role that you do and in the organization that you work for. But I think at the moment we have to work harder at this. We have to work harder to find the hell yeah, to dig out the gold that actually gives us that, that evangelical spirit again to get up and do our best work. Um, so it's just something at the moment I'm finding coming up a lot in my coaching, a lot of leaders really struggling with motivation. Uh, and, and a key to, to, to that is, is, is find your hell yeah, find the thing that really gets you uh, moving. You know, for me, it's this, isn't it? You know, come and do this. And I'm thinking, hell yeah, John, do what you need, do what you're here to do. I mean, you wrote the book, you did the research, for goodness sake, get out there and do it. Um, you know, and that gives me that renews that 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 vigor and that um that passion for the for the topic. So um last one, last habit. Um might, I might sneak in an extra one actually, given the time. I might, I might sneak an extra one in here, but uh, but let's go with this one first. Um, being humble. Um, uh, my, my team and, and I, and in fact, I think Sharon's on the on the webinar tonight. But Sharon, if, if you're on the webinar, you'll remember that we did a, a team coaching session back in probably May, and um, we were working with a, a group of leaders, group of CEOs, um, and they were they were talking a little bit about the pandemic and the crisis, and one of them said. Um, well, I tell you what, um, I'm keeping a little black book. And um, when this is all over, I'm going to get even with all the people that have crossed me. And uh, at, at that point on the on the Zoom, you know, everybody's did a virtual eyebrow lift. Everyone was a bit, a bit shocked. And there was a bit of a silence. And, and one of the other CEOs on the call um, said, um, uh, well, let's make up. The, let's say it was Philip. Uh, turned turned around and said, um, "Philip, uh, have you ever thought about keeping a little white book rather than a little black book?" And uh, it was a really telling comment. And for me, uh, I've thought about that comment a lot since that time. Is uh, I, do I keep a little black book? Yeah, of course I do. I mean, when things are difficult, when we're under stress, isn't it easy to fill your little black book up with people's names? all the people that are irritating you, all the people that didn't do what you thought they were gonna do, all the people that wronged you. In a socially distanced, anxious environment, it's so easy to keep a little black book. And so this habit of being humble, don't keep a little black book, keep a little white book, 
at the end of the day, open your little white book and write in it all the people that did good today. You know, notice the good things, notice the moments that worked well, notice the skills that people had, the gifts that they have, the things they did that went right. I don't think it's natural for us to keep the little white book. And I think we have to work at the little white book rather than keeping the little black book. So it's just a little tip around being. And the reason it's being humble is, you know, people are probably keeping the black book about me. Loads of people are keeping the little black book about me. Um, so if I'm humble about it, I've got to say, well, am I going to just do the same or am I going to, you know, uh, open a little white book instead? So there's just a little a little comment on um, the little white book. So. I'm going to slip in an extra, an extra one here. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to have the time for this, but um, but we have. So let me uh, let me just revisit the habit of evangelizing because if there was one habit right now that is most valuable for us to focus on, it would be this habit of evangelize. And part of the habit of evangelize is resilience. Great evangelists don't realize when they've been knocked down. They don't know how not to get back up again. They keep coming back at you time and time again because they're so passionate about what they do that they can't help themselves. And the greatest evangelist that I have ever worked with is the gentleman on this screen. So I had the privilege in my career of working with some Team GB Olympic sports teams. And one of the athletes uh, that I worked with was a guy called Alan Campbell uh, from Northern Ireland and I first met Alan when he was 19 when he was a, a novice um, scholar and I, and I was invited with his coach with his rowing coach to watch him rowing down on the River Thames in London when he was 19 and he was overweight uncoordinated an obvious novice even to the untrained eyes like myself and at the end of the training session he, he walked up the bank to where I was stood and I was stood with a guy called Bill Barry who was his coach he was an Olympic silver medalist and uh, Bill said to him Alan what's your goal and quick as a flash Alan came back at him and said I want to win a medal in the Olympics and I thought uh, Bill was going to laugh um, because it was the most absurd thing I'd heard for a long long time but Bill paused and then he said to him well um, I'm willing to be your coach but I need you to lose four kilo in weight in the next two months and then they went on this journey this coaching journey for the next 10 years um, which I witnessed and there were many ups and downs on that journey uh, many many ups and downs uh, but Alan never knew when to stop and eventually in 2012 he won the bronze medal in the single skull in London by about that much from the Swedish rower and on that picture that is my hand holding his bronze medal and to this day I still think it's uh, a miracle uh, I can't get my head quite around how it happened and when he got on the podium to pick up the medal he broke down in tears and he sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and it was it was 10 years of courage and resilience coming out of him and uh, you know at the moment one of the things we are called to demonstrate is Olympic levels of resilience don't let this get you refuse to go down be defiant um, and keep pursuing whatever the equivalent is of that medal. Whatever the equivalent of that is to you, don't let this current situation um, be the thing that stops you or, or lays you low. Um, because when you work with people like Alan Campbell, you realize that the depths of resilience that normal people can demonstrate is, is off the scale when they get passionate about something. So that's just a, a final sort of message really about the importance of uh, the evangelized habit it's not just about the hell yeah it's about coming back bouncing back time after time again uh, rather than in um, the current situation in particular letting that sort of uh, crowd us out and, uh, and, and let us low so with that um, that's the end of the, the final sprint I'm going to take a few more questions but just before I do, I want to go back to the beginning and I want to show you this beautiful picture of the Himalayas. Uh, and I want to remind you of, uh, of, uh, of the theme really here is that this is all about um, the new world of work. You know, that, that, uh, that there is a, a possibility and an opportunity to see with new eyes um, through this current crisis. And that um, 
and actually something big may be going on around uh, leadership and work um, and, and there's a chance that it could be exciting uh, and, I, and I, I hope that if nothing else from this this session um, it's given you um, you know that feeling of uh, of hope and, and optimism that uh, you know it's, that, that something big might be happening and we might not yet have fully got our heads around it um, but when we do we might realize that that actually we're making some interesting choices um, and that we're actually building something new um, but the sooner we can see the picture on the box then the better we're, we're all going to feel and I, and I hope that this um, session might have just given you a glimpse of of a picture on a box that is worth um, is worth pursuing in our in our leadership and in our in our work um, so uh, thank you for all, all of your your time and commitment this evening and um, happy to take um, a few more questions Amy before we, we close out Brilliant. Well, I'm certainly feeling optimistic and fired up after all of that. <laughs> um, interestingly, actually, one of the questions that I had marked to go back to uh, has been copied in again to the chat, and I think it is quite an important one. So okay. in this is from Mark. In my experience, I've found building trust with others is more effective face-to-face -face than video call, than phone, than chat and email. Do you have any thoughts on how you better build trust in a more digital world? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of us are, are grappling with with that one. And um, I think I think um, one of the things that I've, I've been saying um, about this is that we are all con unconsciously competent at building trust face to face. You know, we've all been doing it for so long. Um, that we're all unconsciously competent at it. So when we were in the office, or when, you know, we 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 were just so practiced at trust building in that environment that we didn't even notice we were doing it. Now, what I would say in the virtual environment, um, if if I think particularly about Zoom and and, and Teams, um, I think at the moment we're all consciously incompetent at trust building in the virtual environment, and we don't like it, do we? I mean, we hate it. Not to be incompetent about any at, at anything. But particularly if you're conscious of it i mean um so you know at the moment it's a bit awkward isn't it you know we don't we don't really like it um but you know we have a great capacity to learn and to adapt and you know i'm sure when they used the phone for the first time you know people must have felt really weird uh you know when they were first started uh, that and probably when we first started going into offices people probably thought this is a bit strange isn't it um how are we going to build trust in in, in this environment um, so I'm a great believer in, in the adaptability of people. And I think the longer we work in these virtual environments, A, the technology will get better. It just will. Um, and secondly, we will get better. Uh, we will get better and better at being intentional about building trust in virtual environments. And what I would hope is that models that I've shared with you tonight, the nine habits of trust, that people can use that model to be intentional about trust you know let's make it explicit you know we in in our um team at the trusted safety foundation we we have a check-in against the nine habits and we actually talk in the team about you know how do we think we're getting on at the at the nine habits how, how could we demonstrate these habits better in a virtual environment it's that type of conversation that we need to get uh, better at we need to make the challenge explicit if we do and if we work with models uh, like the ones that I've shared with you this evening, we will get better at it. And I think, um, you know, we, we will all gradually climb that learning curve. That was a really detailed answer. Thank you for that, John. Um, I'm just jumping back a little bit in the chat and Claire asked, interestingly earlier, whether you think SMEs might get left behind in some of this transition, whether there is a difference between larger organizations with big budgets and culture change programs and SMEs who are just trying to get by. Mm, interesting, interesting uh, assumption there because um, we, we work and I work with large companies and with and with SMEs and um, and we ourselves are a very small company. Um, I actually I'm actually finding that the, the smaller companies at the moment because of their entrepreneurial flair and, and their and their lack of institutionalization um, are actually are actually adapting um, quicker and are seeing the opportunities quicker. So if I just look at my own business, you know, um, the cost of sales for us have been able to um, 
uh, work virtually and deliver virtually and and the you know the efficiency of that model is just massive i mean it's just uh, you know and so and so if, if we're, in a, we're in an environment where every penny counts you know and if we if we see if we see an opportunity to be able to to, to generate more efficiency out of the model um but we're going to move to it very quickly because it's like a survival thing um now what i notice in some of the corporates and i'm working with a very big uh, oil utility at the moment and i'm finding that their people are really struggling they've just announced a restructure program that's going to take seven months to implement i mean can you imagine being in a in this pandemic in a crisis and then you're working for a global corporate that announces a restructuring program that's going to take seven months to implement and you're not going to find out how it affects you for another four months i mean i'm finding it in corporates it's really really difficult at the moment um, for a lot of people because uh, there's a sense of powerlessness um, and a sense of still being caught up in some machine like structure that makes it really hard for people um, bearing in mind global corporates are the ones that have benefited most from the industrial age they got them you know they benefit the most and they hardwired the practices most deeply so i think it's harder for some of those uh, global corporates to reinvent themselves. And, and I think you will find disruptors coming in, um, in, in all sorts of sectors that, that, that really grasp this, this moment and start to um, agitate around the, uh, the, the norms and, and uh, working models and directors. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Um, one of the questions that's been asked is around this idea of um i'm just scrolling back to it oh i've scrolled back too far apologies for that um it's around this idea of examples so the initiatives that are being launched within companies the way in which people are embedding this trusted executive and the nine habits within companies have you got examples of kind of practical application um, you know, as I say, we, we've, we've been applying this model in the Trust Executive Foundation for, for four years. So we've got a number of pioneers now that have, that have adopted it and, and have rolled it out to different degrees. Uh, actually, on, on the screen at the moment is, is, uh, is the website address. So there are, there are case studies on that website of organizations that have um, decided to put trust at the heart of their culture and have used this model to um, pursue that. And the way that they've done that, again, typically we're starting at the senior level, starting at the top, because that's where um, behaviors get role modeled um, and, and, uh, and, and can be influenced um, if we have that sponsorship from the CEO. So taking the top team through a series of workshops um, to, to, uh, to share the model and to invite them to practice with the model. Uh, and of course, part of that is assessing um, that we have diagnostic tools that allow leaders to assess themselves against those habits. We can run surveys. So we recently ran a survey of a thousand staff in a, um, a large organization, uh, which allowed to generate um, scores for each of those habits um, and, and to then compare those scores and benchmark them with the scores from other organizations in, in the private sector. So over time, what we're, what, what we're hoping with this model is that we can use it as a measurement tool because what, me, what gets measured is treasured. And uh, we know that if we can convert this into numbers, we will appeal to um, that need to measure um, trust. Um, so there are different tactics and techniques that we can use to, to implement this. One of the most powerful things ultimately is that it gives people a language. Um, you know, uh, I walked into an office uh, recently in Kettering uh, and on the wall of that office, four foot high, was, was this model. Um, they actually painted the model on the wall, which sort of took me aback a little bit to see it painted on the wall. What the, what the uh, leader of that uh, business said to me was every time we get to a difficult decision, we lock up and we, and we, and we check in with the habits and we've got it on the wall so we can just look up and check it in. And I think I thought, well, fantastic you know to, to use it as just a language use it as a as a as a check-in tool and just make sure that uh, when you're making big decisions and i think this could apply at a personal level let alone at a business level when you're making big decisions are you really taking conscious awareness of all nine habits or have you got a blind spot somewhere that could trip you up 
and and so you know that's i think the power of, of models that it allows you to uh, to make things explicit to make things measurable and it gives people a language um to talk about what otherwise is a vague emotive topic of of, of trust Perfect. I think I might ask you one more question, if that's OK. Go for it. Um, perfect. So we talked a little bit earlier about how the pandemic may have accelerated the pace of change. But Claire has asked whether the downturn may slow things down again and what your views on that might be. Yeah, I think I think uh, the downturn will 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 create choices uh, for leaders and, people, and leaders will have to decide where they stand um, and um, you know there will be um, there will be leaders uh, that uh, uh, that adopt a traditional response to that downturn I mean there will be leaders that do that and I think there will be leaders that uh, adopt a, a different response uh, and and uh, and see the long-term benefit to their business of making decisions based on uh, on an awareness of the impact on trust of, of those decisions, um, you know the brand brand value and the brand uh, goodwill um, that that brands can can build up in this period is is significant in both directions. And um, you know one of the phrases that uh, uh, that has been used uh, by one of my clients is that you know they were saying that there will be a um, retrospective judgment on brands. Um, you know that when this is all over, there will be retrospective judgment. You know, and and uh, us as consumers, us as employees, um, will exercise re retrospective judgment on brands because we'll see it, and we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll sort the you know the high trust from the low trust brands, and then we'll make decisions based on that that basis. So I, I'd like to think that um, you know more business leaders, because they know uh, the modern world that we're working in, will will make decisions uh, with a slightly different um, mindset perspective than would have been the case 20 years ago. Um, and I, I think that is that will be the case. But but yeah, sure, there will be some uh, leaders that, um, that don't think they've got a choice and um, uh, and will and will sort of uh, will potentially damage trust in that in that situation. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you very much for that, John. It's brilliant. There are some fantastic questions and comments and the discussion in the chat box was on fire all night. So thank you all of you for taking part. I think we had about 120 of us in the room at one point from all over the world, staff, alumni, students. Uh, we have our new full-time MBA cohort who are on their induction week this week. So I really hope that this has set the tone for the rest of the year and the thought processes that they need to embed. So really appreciate your time, John. It's been fantastic having you with us. Those of you who booked on the Eventbrite link will receive the copy of the presentation recording. So the recording will come through. We're also really pleased that we've got a discount on John's book as well. So the discount code will be available in that Eventbrite follow up email. If you didn't book through Eventbrite, then feel free to get in touch with me and I'll make sure that you get the recording and I'll pop my email address in the chat box shortly. We do have another event coming up organised by the Business School Alumni Relations team taking place on the 21st of October. And I'm just going to bring up the information in front of me. It's hosted by George Feiger, 21st of October, Outstanding Leaders on High Stake Decision Making. So take a look at the Eventbrite page and you will get some more information from that. And that leaves me to say thank you to everybody who's participated this evening. It's been absolutely fascinating. I'm feeling all G'd up and ready to jump into an executive online MBA program this evening. So we will be talking all about resilience, which I think I've got lots to add thanks to John's session this evening. So thank you all, have a lovely evening or morning, wherever you are in the world, and we hope to see you at the next event. Thanks, Amy. Good evening all.